All right, good morning, everyone. Let me move this to the center. It feels a bit weird. Anyway, for those of you who are new, uh, we've been going through the book of Galatians. Uh, we are a bit after the midpoint. Uh, so here we are. Uh, so perhaps it's, quick, it's a good time for a quick recap. Uh, Galatians is a letter that Paul wrote to, of course, to Christians in the region of Galatia. And uh, he wrote this because he heard that there were some issues with the churches there. Now, the Galatians were predominantly Gentiles, non-Jews. So circumcision was not part of their culture. Uh, whereas the Jews, who, whereas the Jews uh, would have circumcision as part of their culture, as the mark uh, as, uh, that they are God's people. So when Paul, when Paul first brought good news to, to, the, Galatia, to, to the Galatians, uh, Paul's message was that you can be saved by putting your trust in Jesus, in Jesus alone, and you don't have to fulfill the law of Moses, which includes circumcision. So many, many, many Galatians became, became Christians and the churches were formed there. But when, when, Jew, when some Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem to Galatia, they began to teach these Galatians that faith in Jesus alone is not enough. They must also be circumcised if they want to become a full member of God's family. And that's as a start. And then they have to then also follow the law of Moses. So these Jews managed to convince the Galatians that Paul's message was insufficient. They also accused that Paul was not a real apostle. So because of this, Paul then wrote this letter. Paul felt that he needed to write this letter to the Galatians in order to correct their understanding of salvation and also to help them understand what it means to be Christians. So in chapters 1 and 2, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul begins the letter with his defense of the message and of his ministry. So basically, he's saying that his message is from God, his message, his message and calling are from God, and that his message and his ministry are also endorsed and confirmed by the Jerusalem apostles. And then in chapters 3 to 4, Paul gives an elaborate explanation of the true core of the good news, of the real core of the good news. And then chapters 5 to 6, he then gives the encouragement on how we should live in light of the real good news. Of course, there are some overlapping in between, but that is the sort of the rough division. So today's passage is sort of the transition from this section to that section. The transition from the explanation to the practical encouragement. But before, before Paul moves to the practical encouragements, he closes this section, he closes his arguments by telling them three short sections on three different things. Three short sections on three different things. In uh, verse chapter 4, 12 to 20, Paul explains how he is different from the false teachers. And then in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 21 to 31, Paul contrasts the new covenant from the old covenant. And then in chapter 5, 1 to 12, Paul shows how life in Jesus, life with Jesus, is the total opposite of life under the law. So, two teachers, two covenants, and two ways of life. That's what we're going to look at. So they are in your outline. Feel free to follow along. Uh, because this is a long passage, um, so we can't really go through all the details in each of the, in, in, in the passage. So there are, some pas there are some verses that I might not even touch. Uh, that's because of the time. But feel free to ask or feel free to check with me or feel free to uh, go through that in your life group as well. Okay? So firstly, two teachers. Now in this section from chapter, four, from chapter 4 from verse 12 to 20, Paul shows the contrast between him and the false teachers and the Jewish teachers who came to Galatia uh, to twist the good news. And he does, this, he does this because the Galatians' attitude towards Paul has cha have changed, has, has shifted. When Paul vi first visited them, they, they gave Paul a very warm welcome, a very warm welcome. They embraced the gospel message and they loved Paul. But from the time those Jewish false teachers arrived at Galatia, the Galatians' attitude towards Paul has changed. That's why he says, what then has become of your blessedness? What has, what has changed? You, were so, you, you, treat, you treated me so well, you embraced me, you welcomed me, but why you are treating me like an enemy? 
So Paul feels the need to help them understand that those Jews, that those false teachers were actually up to no good. Now I remember, I remembered I hated physics when I was in year 10 and 12. Okay, we started learning physics from year 7, 8 and 9. I was like, okay, whatever. But in year 10 and 11, I did not like it. Partly because the teachers, the teacher did not do a good job explaining Okay, I know, right? If you don't learn, then just blame the teacher. Okay, no, no, don't be like me. Don't be so quick to blame your teacher if you don't understand the material. Just in case you don't understand what I'm saying today. Okay, but but in year twelve, in year twelve, suddenly I loved physics. Suddenly physics made sense. Why? Because there was this teacher that labored very hard to explain physics very well, and he made sure that physics got into our mind and got into our heart that we really love physics. So that's one teacher. But I also remember one of my middle school teachers about year eight. Every time he entered the class, I had no idea what he was doing. Now, I know some of you think that. I think you are the problem. Anyway, uh, but he did speak well, though. He did the teacher speak well of some students who apparently gave him some presents during Christmas time and some financial gifts during Ramadan. Good. So it was almost a public knowledge that he would only give good marks to those who would give him some gifts. Okay, so that's a contrast. The first teacher, his mission is to help the students to form physics into their mind and heart. But the second, his mission was really for his own personal gain. Now, if you grow up in Australia, probably you never had the second type teacher. It's your loss, anyway. But if if you grew no no if you grew up somewhere else. Probably you did, right? Probably you can, you can, yeah, I have that kind of teacher and I have the other kind of teacher as well. But I'm sure all of you can think of someone who would fit into the first category, some, a teacher that you appreciate a lot, right? Well, this is what Paul is trying to explain in, in chapter 4, verse 17 to 19. Basically, he's saying, you know, those false teachers, they speak well of you, they flatter you, but their intention is not about you. They are propping you up with their words, but in the end, what they want is that you prop them up with everything else. These false teachers, their ultimate agenda is actually for their own personal gain. On the other hand, Paul is different. Paul's intention is never to flatter the Galatians so that the Galatians will elevate Paul. Paul's ultimate intention is only one. He says in verse 19, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul cares for them like a parent to his children, to her children, and he will labor as hard as he can, as painful as it may be, to make sure that Christ is formed in the Christians in Galatia. That is his final goal. Paul labors so that the Galatians would know Christ, would trust Christ, would love Christ, and that they will become more and more like Jesus Christ. Paul labors so that people can see Christ in these Galatians. That is his ultimate, ultimate goal. And that's how a true teacher differs from a false teacher. So my question to you, if you are a leader, now if you are a leader, if you hold some influential position somewhere, a facilitator in a particular ministry, or if you are a ministry leader, let me ask you, what is your end game? What is your end game? I hope that your end game is not your personal goal, or your personal, not your own personal gain, sorry. I hope it's not your own personal gain. Your end game must not be to control or to dominate your followers so that they will elevate you in the end. Your end game must be to make sure that Christ is formed in them. To make sure that each of your members know Christ, trust Christ, grow in Christ, love Christ, become more like Christ and be confident in proclaiming Christ, both in their words and in their works. Your end game must be to labor so that they become more and more like Christ. On the other hand, though, if as a Christian, this should be our attitude towards our leaders. We should welcome our leaders. We should appreciate our leader, not because, not because of how he or she looks, because Paul mentioned that when he first visited the Corinthians, his appearance was not very pleasant to look at. 
but yet the Galatians still welcome him. So we should appreciate not because how our leaders look, but not because of how eloquent your leaders are, but because of the truth, because of the truth of the message that your leaders bring. If your leader labors to teach you the right truth, then receive them, appreciate them, honor them, and take time to encourage them in many ways. But if they are teaching the wrong things, call them out. Leaders are human as well. They make mistakes. So correct them, admonish them, and rebuke them lovingly. So if you are a leader, your end game must be to form Christ in, in your members. But if you are a Christian, appreciate your leaders, especially if they teach you uh, the, 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 the right thing from the scripture. So that's the first section, two teachers. Paul is contrasting between him and the, uh, the false teachers. And then Paul moves to explain to the Galatians the two covenants, the old and the new covenants. And for this, he used Sarah and Hagar as his illustration. Now for you to really appreciate this, let me quickly give you the story of Sarah and Hagar. Okay, so the, the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar is told in the book of Genesis, chapter 12 to chapter 22. Sarah was the wife of Abraham, and Sarah had, a, had an Egyptian female servant named Hagar. Now, when, when Abraham was 75 years old, God, God, God told Abraham that he would be a father of great nation. Now, by this stage, Abraham and Sarah did not have any children. So after waiting for several years, no child yet, Sarah could not wait any longer. So Sarah, so, she, so Sarah said to Abraham, his wife said to Abraham, you know what? I cannot bear children at all. God has not made good of his promise. So you know what? Let's not wait for God. Let's make this happen ourselves. Why don't you go and sleep with Hagar? That way you will have a son. And Abraham agreed. And he had a son with Hagar. Now, I could imagine he said to Sarah, Okay, Sarah, I'll do it for you, okay? Remember? It's for you, okay? No, no, he didn't say that. We, did, we didn't know what he said. Okay, he didn't say anything. Okay, it's a good husband there. He didn't say anything. Anyway, he named the... Okay, chill, chill. Okay. He named the son Ishmael. He named the son Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the son that, that God promised for Abraham. So God appeared again to Abraham and told Abraham that, you would have a son with Sarah, as I promised. So long story short, when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, a son was born to Sarah and they named him Isaac. So that's, that's the, the short story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael and Isaac. And Paul used Sarah and Hagar to illustrate the difference between the old and the new covenant. So Paul practically says this, that Hagar represents Mount Sinai, which is the place where God gave the Israelites the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant from Moses. While Sarah represents the new covenant. Hagar represents the present Jerusalem. The present Jerusalem, as in they are focused on the temple, they're so focused on the old covenant, doing the sacrifice, focused on that geographical place. While Sarah represents the new and coming Jerusalem. Look forward to the return of Jesus. Look forward to the real identity that we have in heaven. Hagar was a woman in slavery, a servant a woman, and Sarah was a free woman. Now, what about Ishmael? Ishmael is the son of the slave woman, and therefore Isaac is the son of the free woman, son of Sarah. And Ishmael was born according to human intervention, not according to God's promise. While Isaac was born according to God's promise, not according to human intervention. Ishmael was not the true heir of Abraham, while Isaac was the true heir of Abraham. So Paul is, basically when Paul illustrates this, Paul is saying that if you really want to claim, if you really want to claim that you are the sons of Abraham, if you really want to claim that you are sons of Abraham, well, you need to know the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. And you need to make sure that you are the true son of Abraham. So are you Ishmael or are you Isaac? Because the true son of Abraham was not the one that was born out of human's intervention. The true son of Abraham was born out of God's promise. So it's basically saying this is the two covenants. Which son are you? 
Now, I have to say that Paul is very careful when he says that he's using the example of Sarah and Hagar. He says that, let me use this allegorically. Let me use Sarah and Hagar, and Hagar as illustrations. So, Paul is not saying, Paul is not saying that Sarah is good, is good and Hagar is bad, or Ishmael is all bad and Isaac is all good. No, he's not saying that. If you read Genesis, you will see that Sarah was not flawless in many ways. And God actually cared for Hagar as well. So make sure you don't read what Paul is not saying. Paul is just using Sarah and Hagar as illustrations. Okay, But what Paul is saying is pretty clear. He's saying basically, if you choose to follow the old covenant, if you rely on your own effort for your salvation, then you are not the true son of Abraham then you are actually Ishmael. You are actually the son of the slave woman because you think you can obtain God's promise with your own works. But if you choose the new covenant, if you rely on God's promise by faith, then you are the true son of Abraham. Then you are actually Isaac, the son of the free woman, because you know that you cannot obtain God's promise with with your own works. So you rely on God and you trust in God. So Paul is contrasting the two. That's why he says in verse 31, So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So I suppose the question for all of us as well is, which son, which son, which son are we? Which son do we want to be? Do we want to be free to trust in Jesus and be free? Or do we want to trust in ourselves and to live under the slavery especially the slavery of the law. Okay, so which son are you? And that leads to final that leads to Paul's final point, the two ways of life. He started chapter 5 with this, for freedom Christ has set you has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you choose Christ, you'll be free. If you, choose, if you don't choose Christ, then you will still be enslaved by the old covenant law. If you choose, fra- choose Christ, not fra- choose Christ, you'll be free. See, free in Christ becomes free. If you choose Christ, you'll be free from the slavery of the law, from the slavery of your sin. But if you don't choose Christ, you'll, you'll still have to follow the law. You'll still be enslaved. And you, and you realize that you cannot, be, you cannot break free from your sin. Now, the movie John Wick 3 has just hit the cinema, starring Keanu Reeves. Okay, not related to Sam Reeves, unfortunately. Although Keanu is not as half as it's not half as cool as Sam Reeves. Okay, so <laughs> but Sam is not here, so <laughs> when the cat is not around, the <laughs> anyway. Okay, I'm I'm pretty sure he's okay with this. Anyway, he's having fun. Okay, in, in but this is. Okay, let, let, let me move to this one. Okay, but in 1999, in 1999, 20 years ago, Keanu Reeves already appeared in another, another movie trilogy, uh, The Matrix. Now, anyone here, hands up if you have watched The Matrix. Not many of you. Some of you are not born yet. I know that. <laughs> yes. Okay, some of... Anyway. Okay. Now, anyway, the, you should watch it. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. I think it's really great. Okay, anyway... Um, The movie tells the story of, no spoiler, don't worry. The movie tells the story of Neo, uh, Keanu Reeves is Neo, a computer hacker. His name is John Anderson, but Neo is like the the nickname, the the, the virtual nickname. So he was a computer hacker, and he he begins to be suspicious about reality. Okay, but long story short, he is then brought to a guy named Morpheus, who can help explain his suspicion. So, sitting in front of each other, uh, Morpheus, this guy, says, to, says this to Neo. He says, what you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. Something's wrong with the world. You don't know what, but it's there. Like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It's, it is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now Morpheus then tells Neo that everyone in this world is born into bondage, born into a prison, a prison for their mind, and they don't even know it. And then Morpheus asks Neo to make a choice, 
Now, this is the famous scene. Morpheus shows Neo two pills, a blue pill and a red pill. Okay, don't argue with me about colors. Okay, just this is red and blue. Just trust me. Okay, if you see different things, don't argue with me. You know, this all this color argument in the I don't know what's happening. Anyway, so if Neo took a blue pill, the blue pill, the story would end there. And Morpheus says, you will wake up in your bed, your life will, will continue, your life will go on, you will, ha you will ha have no recollection whatsoever. Life continues on. But he knows that he will still be in the prison of this world. But if he, if he took the red pill, he would then be reborn. He would become a new person and he would be set free from the bondage and his eyes will be open and he would know the true reality. So Neo decides to take the red pill. He then undergoes the process of this rebirth in a high-tech capsule pod, and the story unfolds from there. So if you watch, no, I'm not going to spoil it, but just watch it. The movie Matrix is just talking, I mean, it's very much aligned with, the, with what Christianity is all about, surprisingly. So that's what Paul is saying to the Galatians. You've got to choose one of two. The red pill being Jesus, or the blue pill, the circumcision. If you choose Jesus, you'll be set free. You'll be born again, you'll be a new creation, and the new you is then free from the slavery of the law. Free to know the real truth, free from the slavery of sins, and you will find, you will find rest. You'll find rest knowing that Jesus has conquered sin and conquered death on your behalf. But if you decide to rely on circumcision for your salvation, well, that means you are choosing the other pill. Then it means that you have to fulfill the whole law. You will spend the rest of your life trying, trying to work your way into, to get righteousness, to get salvation, to get that security identity. But you know you will not get there. And you will still be, you will still be the old you. You are in bondage under the law. In verse 3, he says, I testify again that everyone who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You think that you're in control of your life, but you're not. And if you, choose your, if you choose circumcision, then you no longer receive God's grace. You no longer receive Jesus' grace because you have decided to use your own effort to save you. You are severed from Christ. You who will be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. That's why Paul commands them in verse 1 to stand firm. Stand firm and do not submit to the yoke of slavery. The temptations to go back to your old life is there, but stand firm. Don't go back to your old life. Don't go back to the yoke of slavery again. Stand firm. So there are really only two ways of life in this world. Whether you call yourself a Christian or not, whether you go, go to church or not, everyone in this world has got, there are only two ways of life. You rely on your own effort for your salvation or you rely on Jesus for your own salvation. Rely on your effort as in following the law, following the rules, following the regulations, following all kinds of uh, religious uh, to-do list, or you just rely on Jesus for your salvation. You have to choose one or the other. They are mutually exclusive. Now, Paul is not saying now, Paul is not saying that circumcision is sin, okay? Paul is not saying that circumcision is sin. Circumcision in and of itself is actually neutral. If you want to do it for some personal reason, go for it. But it becomes a problem if you rely on it for your salvation. It becomes a problem if you think that you have to do that in order for you to, get, to be saved. And we, we all have all kinds of versions of circumcision, quote unquote. Some of you think that you have to do, 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 to do this. Some of you need to do things that you have to spend this much time at church. Some of you think that you might have to do this and to go through different things in order for you to be saved. And those things are maybe, those things may be good in and of itself. But if you start to rely on them for your salvation, then it ruins the whole thing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you so much add even a little bit to Christ, for your salvation, it is like adding a little leaven, a little yeast to a dough. It affects everything. In fact, it ruins everything. So Paul was very serious about this. Paul was very serious about this. And you cannot doubt 
Paul's seriousness after reading what he said in verse 12. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Paul is saying that if those Jews put their pride on their flesh, put their pride in their circumcision, put pride in what they do to their flesh, might as well go all the way. Why stop halfway? Well, obviously, Paul chose this kind of strong language to make a strong point for the Galatians, to wake them up a little bit. And that should be a strong warning to all of us as well. If we, if we rely so much on a little bit on what we do with our flesh, what we do with our works, then it ruins everything. Might as well leave Jesus and go all the way, do whatever you want to do, because it doesn't affect your, it doesn't help with your salvation at all. So don't add even a little thing to Christ for our salvation. It will not help. If anything, it ruins everything. Okay, but we have to make, we have to be clear. Obeying God for our salvation is different from obeying God because we know we have been saved. Okay, so we'll look at that in the next few Sundays. So this is the end. This is the end of the explanation section of Galatians. Okay, Paul contrasts the two teachers, the two covenants, and the two ways of life as a way to summarize his, his as a way to summarize his explanation section, and hoping that the Galatians will make the right choice, hoping that the Galatians will abandon their reliance upon the law, upon their own effort, and actually to put their hope and faith in Christ alone for salvation. And next Sunday, then we will look at the practical implications of our faith in Christ. But I don't want to leave you with verse 12, right? This is not a good memory verse. You don't tell your kids, memorize this. Okay, I wish those who... No, you don't want that, okay? So, <laughs> sorry. But I want to leave you with verse 6. I think this is his point. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. Now you can almost swap circumcision here with a lot of different things in life. A lot of good things in life. And many things in life are actually, are actually good or, or, or maybe, maybe neutral in and of themselves. They are not sin. They are perhaps even good things, but none of them should be the basis for our salvation. We should not rely on them to get right with God. In God's economy, what counts is one and only one thing. Your faith in Christ. Only Christ can save us, so we put our trust in Him alone. But our faith in Christ is not a dead faith. It's not a dead faith. It is not a faith that ends in and of itself without producing anything in us. Because it says here, this faith is actually faith that is working through love. So it was Martin Luther, the father of Reformation, who said this. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. If you can just remember that for our Christian life, for, ourself, for, for, our, for our Christian life, I think we'll be on the right track. We are saved by faith alone, but once you are saved, you know that your faith is never alone. You cannot say that I have faith, but I'm not doing anything at all. Your faith must produce the good works in you. Must, your faith must work itself out in our love for God, in our love for one another. And we'll look more into this at the next two Sundays. Okay, so let me pray and I'll take questions. Father God, we thank you so much for showing us from your word, Lord. Again and again, reminding us that we cannot save ourselves with our own effort. We cannot save ourselves with anything that we do with our flesh. We can only rely on Jesus. And we know that you have revealed to us that Jesus has died on the cross for our sins that He has risen again from the dead so that we can trust in Him. We can put our faith in Him knowing that He will raise us as well in the end and will bring us to Him. So we thank You, Father. So help us to cling on to Jesus, not to cling on to other things. Help us to help one another to cling on to Jesus as well. In whose name we pray. Amen.